Hi, I'm Hannah Victoria and welcome back to my crime and policing channel. In today's session, it might sound a little bit dull, right? In fact, that's not a way to sell it, is it? In today's session, we're looking at the most exciting, the most important part of policing. And you know what? Actually, it could be. So what we're looking at is the National Decision Model, or also affectionately known as the NDM in the police service and others. The National Decision Model underpins police activity and responses and it has done for the last 10 years or so. Now the National Decision Model is a tool used so that when um, something happens you've got to react to it that you make the right decisions at that time and I will tell you how. So the National Decision Model has six components on it and at the heart of those one of those six components is the code of ethics. Now the code of ethics should be integral to every single thing that a police officer does or anybody who works with the police. The code of ethics is comprised of policing principles and standards of professional behaviour. Now those policing principles are as follows. Accountability. You need to be accountable for what you do. That makes sense, right? Fairness. You have to act fairly, obviously. Honesty, you are truthful and honest. I cannot specify that one enough. You have to be honest. You know, if you make a mess up of something, if you've completely arsed something up, you put your hand up and you're honest because it's so much easier to fix than it is if you try and sweep it under the carpet. So we've got accountability, fairness, honesty, integrity. So that's, that's in you. That is your own moral compass. How, how much integrity have you got to do the right thing? Always do the right thing, okay? Leadership, so you lead by a good example. Objectivity, so you make decisions based on the evidence and things around you. You don't just go with your own personal bias. You, you look at things objectively. Openness, you are open, you are transparent. You're not hiding anything under that rug. Respect, got to be one of the most important ones, right? You respect people, you treat others with respect. And lastly, selflessness. So if you're selfless, you put in other people's interests before your own. And importantly, with the police code of ethics, those other people are the public. The, what's right for the public is what you should be focusing on. And the code of ethics should be at the heart of every decision you make as a police officer or anybody who works in the policing family. So let's go through those again. We've got accountability, fairness, honesty, integrity, leadership, objectivity, openness, respect and selflessness. They're the principles that underpin everything you do. And these shouldn't be a massive surprise. So if you're in the police now, you're training or you're having a bit of a refresher, that shouldn't shock you. And if you don't think you're honest or you have integrity or respect for people, you really shouldn't be working for the police. Maybe consider a different job like politics, I don't know. So, like I said, it's two elements that fit into this, which is the policing principles and the professional standards. The standards of professional behaviour linking quite seamlessly with these policing principles. And in fact, they are kind of embedded in there. The first one of these is honesty and integrity. And that's where you are promising that you will be honest and act with integrity at all times. You'll never abuse your position as a police officer. And if you have power, you're not going to abuse it. Authority, respect and courtesy. And that's why you are promising that you will act with self-control and tolerance, treating members of the public and your colleagues with respect and courtesy. You'll use your powers of authority lawfully and proportionately and will respect the rights of all individuals. Number three on that list is equality and diversity. Now then, this is huge in terms of, it should be everywhere, right? Equality and diversity is a huge part of policing and the standards of professional behaviour, list equality and diversity as such. I will act with fairness and impartiality. I will not discriminate unlawfully or unfairly. Straightforward, right? Number four is use of force. Now, when you join the police, you get given these powers, right? You get given weapons, you get given handcuffs, you get given CS spray and batons. You get given these things that anybody else walking down the street would be um, arrested for having. You've got this stuff and you can use force to detain people or to prevent other things from happening. But you have to use that force proportionately, uh, lawfully and, um, yeah, not 
abusing that use of force. So number four is use of force. And the standard of professional behaviour lists it as, I will only use force as part of my role and responsibilities. And only to the extent that it's necessary. You wouldn't um, hit somebody over the head or anything like that. And you, you'd never get your baton out if someone was just stood there waiting for you to arrest him. You just, it's got to be proportionate, it's got to be necessary. You're reasonable in all the circumstances. You cannot use force willy-nilly. You can't just wander about smacking people. That's not okay, okay? You've been given that power, you don't abuse it, and that use of force is something that they take very, very seriously. Number five is orders and instructions. As a police officer, you give out and you follow instructions and orders. It's not hard. And if you can't follow orders and instructions, you shouldn't be in the police. And they are lawful orders, by the way, not just something you made up. It's got to be lawful. You've got to abide by police regulations and give reasonable instructions only and will follow all reasonable instructions. There are 10, so bear with me. Duties and responsibilities sits in at number six. And you are saying, I will be diligent in the exercise of my duties and responsibilities. Basically, you're going to, you take them seriously, you're going to do them. You've got that responsibility to them, you're going to do them, okay? confidentiality now this is a big one that surprisingly does actually get abused occasionally and you've got to treat all information with respect um, and you can only access and disclose it if you need to uh, like in the proper course of your duties you've got access to a lot of systems when you work for the police and if you use those where you shouldn't be you can get penalized gross misconduct even like fired for looking at stuff you're not supposed to be looking at People have got a right to their, um, you know, their family and private life, as you know, in human rights, hello. You're not allowed just to go and have a look. So it's not as if you go, hmm, I've just started dating this guy. I'm going to check him out on the Police National Computer, PNC, to see if he's got any criminal records. You cannot do that, okay? You can find out if they've got any domestic violence and stuff like that through a proper way, such as by um, Claire's Law. If you call 101, the police number in England, and ask, you know, to invoke Claire's law to cost you start seeing somebody, it's not malicious or anything. You, you generally want to know if this person is safe to be around you, maybe your children. You can do Claire's law and also Sarah's law, which is when you're looking at if someone's got a history of harming children. And you can do that, but not on your own back. You've got to go through the proper channels, okay? Number eight is fitness for work. You cannot turn up to work pissed. There you go. But that's not what it says in the thing. Fitness for work is you've got to ensure that when you're on duty or you're at work, you can actually carry out your duties so that you're fit to carry out your responsibilities. But in all seriousness, you can't turn up to work hungover. I know someone who very nearly lost their, their job, it wasn't me, because they turned up to work having been at a party all night and were still a little bit woozy. I'm not going to let you drive a police car. Come on. So yeah, you've got to turn up. You've got to be fit for work. If you're not fit for work, you are not coming in because you get a lot of power and responsibilities. Come on now. Number nine is conduct. And this is like, I will behave in a manner whether on or off duty. And that means that even if you're at home or whatever, you're on a night out, you cannot be acting like a complete clown. When you attest, so when you become a police officer, you are a police officer. You don't just take your hat off and that's it. You're no longer a police officer. That's part of you now. And you've got to act and respect that as well. You are a member of community that other people might look up to and respect. And seeing you, I don't know, table dancing in Yates's is not going to do you or the force any favours. Okay? So you have to um, have good conduct. So behave in a manner, whether in or outside of work, which does not bring credit to the police service or undermine public confidence in policing. So you can't be going to a football match, smashing cans against your head and, I don't know, graffiti knobs on bus stops when you're out of uniform. Or when you're in uniform either, by the way. When you are not in that uniform, if you're a police officer, it doesn't matter. You've always got to behave well. I've got <laughs> friends who have been on Facebook and um, quite innocent pictures, really, but they've been reprimanded, and I have as well, been reprimanded for what's on Facebook. It's not worth it, guys. It's not worth it. Honestly, it's very embarrassing. Don't do it. Uh, and lastly, is challenging and reporting improper behaviour. That's really important. If you see something bad happening, you bloody well report it. It doesn't say that either. It says, 
I will report, challenge or take action against conduct of colleagues which has fallen below the standards of professional behaviour. And that is your duty. So you might be like, oh, I won't grasp on my mates. If they were your friends, they wouldn't put you in a position where you had to, for a start. If they were um, worth the salt and that police badge, they wouldn't be having conduct, displaying conduct that goes against those ethics. You're a police officer, a police employee. You have got trust from the public to do the right thing. And as you know from watching the news and stuff like that, when you don't do the right thing, everybody knows about it. And it sets police back years. For every 10,000 amazing police officers there are in the world, there's a couple of really bad ones. And really, really bad ones. And those people give the rest of years a bad name. So if you see something happening, even if it's just like low level, you think, mm, you report it. Okay? Simple, really. There are departments which work on those reports and things like that and the police do take conduct very seriously and i know already there's going to be hundreds of comments in these going oh they're all corrupt <laughs> well some of them are obviously and when they get found out they get fired there's the professional standards there's the independent police complaint committees and stuff like that who deal with all these complaints and they take it super seriously so if you do feel something has happened to you you've been a victim of um, police misconduct, report it. And if you see your colleagues doing it, report it. And most importantly, don't do it yourself. Anyway, so these things are the code of ethics and that sits at the heart of the national decision-making model. Bing, like there it is. And around that are five other things. And those things are what help you rationalize your thoughts and behaviors before you go to a job. So before you go and do whatever you're doing, it's like a risk assessment. The first thing you do in this cycle so you know that the heart of you is a code of ethics you're a solidified certified good egg you're a solid gold egg ah. well the first thing you're going to do is gather information and intelligence you don't, you don't just wander in somewhere with no idea what's going on usually so you gather intel and intelligence as much as you can and that could be from you know you've, you're being dispatched from somebody usually unless you've come across something um, you'll call control, so you speak to people on the radio and get some info and intelligence about where you're going, who's going to be there, what's the scene like, are there any, you know, witnesses, suspects, victims, what equipment do you need to take with you? So that's what you do when you're gathering your info and intelligence, everything you need to know about this scene. Maybe you're going to go and see a suspect, you want to know about this suspect, you want to know, have they got previous history for attacking police officers? Do they carry weapons? Are they probably or possibly on drugs? Do they have any medical things you need to know about? Have they got mental ill health and got PTSD or something like that? Do you have to approach that person in a certain way? You need to find out all this stuff, if you can, before you go to these scenes. And this can happen quite quickly. Once you get used to using the model, you just roll through it and it becomes a lot easier. So the second thing you do after you've gathered information and intelligence is assess threat and risk and develop a working strategy. Now you will obviously have your risk assessment training, I hope, when you join the police. You'll look at how to do these. So you're assessing the threat and the risk. So like I've said, we're getting all this information and intelligence about somebody. You know, let's say that the person you're going to carries weapons. So you go to this scene thinking this guy's gonna carry a weapon. You need to know, you're gonna wear your stab vest. You should wear that anyway. You should wear all your equipment and you may have to take this weapon off somebody. You might want to approach them in a different way. Maybe you then find out that there's a, a risk here, that there are people there with him and he might injure those other people. So other stuff you've got to assess. So you assess your threat and risk and develop a working strategy. And that could be you deploy specialist trained officers. Maybe it's a suicide, a live suicide attempt, and you need to send somebody to go and talk to him. You don't want to send somebody in there like, what are you doing, mate? You want to send somebody in there who's got those negotiating skills and things like that, nine times out of ten. Then you consider your powers and policy. So under your powers, can you detain that person? Can you disarm them? Can you use force to do what you need to do at that moment in time? Then you identify your options and contingencies. Get a list of options. What can we do here? What's the best way to go about this? And what would happen if we do? What can we do instead? You weigh up everything. 
like I said, bearing in mind at the heart of that is a code of ethics. And also the main two things as a police officer are preserving life and protecting property. So that's what you're looking at. The first thing you're doing, you need to look after people and protect stuff. Okay? So you identify your options and contingencies to be able to do that. Then you take action. And when you've taken that action, you review what's happened and then after that you record it. So that's your national decision model. As I mentioned, right in the middle, I keep pointing, I don't even know where my heart is. Right in the middle is the code of ethics. And like I said, that's in policing principles, the standards of professional behaviour that you must have if you are a police officer. If you haven't got them, you need to leave. And I know it sounds pretty harsh, right? But get out. The first thing you do is gather information and intelligence. I've mentioned that, right? Get all the intelligence you need. And the reason why this model is in place is because when an operation comes in, a, an event happens, your natural um, adrenaline is going to kick in and that cortisol and fight or flight, it's all flying about everywhere. And you're like, oh, what do I do? So having a model like the NDM helps you get everything right and hopefully make the best decisions. There have been times when people have used the NDM and still got it wrong. But because they'd shown they did everything in their power to make the right decision, they haven't been treated as gross misconduct because in that same situation, would somebody else have acted the same following this process? There is a mnemonic which makes up the NDM to help you remember it, apparently. And it's like <laughs> C-I-A-P-O-R. C-I-A-P-O-R. Now, depending on how you pronounce it, Siapor or Kiapor or Chiapor, um, obviously it's up to you, but that's the letters to help you remember it and six of them like five. So code of ethics, information, so you're gathering information and intelligence. Assess, so you're assessing risk and threat uh, and you develop your working strategy. P, powers and policies, you've got to consider those. O is your um, options and contingencies and then R for the C or poor is action and review, apparently. That might help, might not, I don't know. But yeah, C or poor, that's how they remember it in the policing world. I just remember it as, I, I can like, see the little picture in my head, I'm gonna put it here, <gasps> wow. And um, that's how I remember it, I go around the cycle. I'm quite a visual though, so maybe that's why it is. So this is the NDM then. As I mentioned, right at the heart is the code of ethics. Then you've got your gathering info and intel. So code of ethics is your C for C or poor, I is for your info and intel. A is for assessing threat and risk and developing your working strategy. Then P is for your consideration of your powers and policy. O, you are identifying your options and contingencies. And R, you take action and review. I really don't know if you find the see a poor thing helpful. I like to see it as a diagram. But let's run through a little case then. So let's say there is um, someone outside a local school smoking cannabis. So you're gathering your info and intel, right? So this is a school, right? There's kids inside there. This guy is smoking cannabis outside it. And he's already had a cannabis warning. What's he up to? You assess threat and risk. So the threat and risk is that these kids are going to smell cannabis or be um, introduced to this horrible smell and stuff. And you don't want that. You don't want that kind of stuff for your kids, do you? Um, you develop a working strategy from then. Then you consider your powers and policy. So I mentioned you've already gathered the cannabis boy. These things escalate, but it's outside school, which is a bad thing. So you want to remove him from that place as quickly as possible. So you look at how you're going to do that. And that's when you look at your options and contingencies. Then you take action and review what happened. You might arrest him. You might do something else. Up to you. You are the police officer. You know the law. Um, and then you review what happened and see how you'd do better next time or what you did well. And that's how you use the NDM. I hope that's useful and yeah thank you for watching please like the video and subscribe if you like what i do and um, look after yourself look after each other and please don't commit any crimes